uh, push record. I'll start. I'm Stuart. I'm in Salt Lake. Uh, super grateful for all of you. This is going to be such a fun year with the Young Dentist Program. Um, I think this is our, what, 15th, maybe 16th year doing the Young Dentist Program. And David is always the one who is the mentor for all of you. It's, it, without him, we couldn't do it. So, it's so I'm so grateful for him. I'm grateful for Utah Valley Dental Lab. Um, they kind of make everything that we do possible here with the Young Dentist Program. And uh, David also. So I have a giant standard poodle. Her name is Fergie. And, um, she's black. So 10 year old poodle. Okay, David, your turn. All right. I'm David Hornbrook and uh, it's actually been 20 years because Chris Hammond was our first young dentist okay. in 1999. So it's been 20 years. Nice. So it started off where I just invited one person that was voted by the, the Crown Council membership to be the young dentist. And they got to spend just individual time with me and and we just allow it to keep growing. And last year we had almost 50, I think. And this year probably similar. And, and so I'm in San Diego. It's, uh, it's starting, our weather is, is starting to turn. It's starting to get really cold. It's like 63. <laughs> Funny. Funny. <laughs> um, and I have, a, I have a golden doodle. You'll probably see him. He always comes to our courses. So um, you'll get a chance. Looking forward to it. Nice. Okay. Who's next? Uh, should, we, should we go in order? Is, is your guys looking at the same screen as mine? So, I don't know. Yep. Yes. <laughs> uh, sure, I'll kick it off. Hey, my name is Garrett Johansson. I'm uh, from Fort Worth, Texas. And so, um, yeah, two, two years out of school. Uh, so, yeah, just trying to improve upon everything. This course came highly recommended, so I'm looking forward to it. So, um, I have a dog. I'm not really sure exactly what he is. We we're told he's black lab golden retriever. So yeah. He looks like a, you know what a flat coat retriever looks like. That's kind of what he looks like. Oh, nice. Uh, his name is his name's George. So George, very good. Georgie. Look what you started. You've never done this before. We're now it's a a, a pet. This pet is coffee. great. This is great. There you go. Who's our pet? If yes. there's if there's one thing that everyone's always passionate about, it's their pet. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Welcome, Thanks. Can you come on next? Oh, Chelsea. am I next? Sure, go ahead, Chelsea. Okay, I'm Chelsea. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, and I have a black lab Australian Shepherd dog. His name is Jackson. Jackson. Nice. Chelsea, remind me, um, were you referred to the program or how'd you find us? I forget. Uh, my father-in-law uh, told me about it. He mm -hmm. recommended I take it. Okay. Cool. So I'm really looking forward to it. Who's, who's your father-in-law? Michael Maniscalco. Oh, yeah. I know Mike. Yeah, good guy. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Who's next? Nick, are you next? Yeah, hey. Hey, I'm Nick. Um, I'm a 2018 grad. I practice. I uh, took over for a retiring doc in downtown San Diego. Um, I had a 20 pound white poodle that uh, unfortunately passed away last month. So a little sad about that. It was pet oh, conversation. Man. It'd be a bummer on that. Oh, Sorry about that. Uh, but she's a good dog. Um, yeah, stoked to be here. I, I was at the, the event last year in Vegas. Uh, and then, but actually, I think I joined Crown Council like literally the week before. So I was a little late to the party to get going on the young dentist thing then. But you know, it's all good. Uh, give me another year experience to, you know, I think, take a little bit more out of this. So I'm excited for it. Good. And remind me again where you practice. Where'd you say? Oh, San Diego. David, do you know? Uh, I don't. I don't. Where, where downtown are you? I, so I took over for uh, a guy that had been there since, uh, like, the 50s. Um, Tubasing, Roger uh, Tubasing. He's uh, a second and A right by the Civic Center. Oh, I didn't even know there was a practice over there. Yeah, I don't, it's, it's I don't live far from there because I live on Seventh and Seventh and J. Okay, yeah, um, stop by any time, man. We're uh, <laughs> we're in the original dental medical building. Oh, really? And I'm the last dentist or medicine practiced in the building. Uh, we've been there continually operated in the same space since 1929. Wow. Yeah, so it's, there's some struggles with that, you know. <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope they've replaced some of their equipment since then. Yeah, we, we did. And actually, um, you know, we, uh, you might know 
some of the people I'm involved with, um, the Libby's, Landon. Oh, yeah, they were at my course this weekend, both yep. Yep. both Landon and Justin. Yep. Um, so yeah, so we're he's he's kind of helping me out with that practice and. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, cool. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Good beer. Nice. Okay. Um, to my this side, I don't know who you are. Yeah, I don't know your name. To my to my yeah <laughs> myself Eddie. Right here. Hi. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm calling in. I'm actually um, on my way home. So I'm calling in for my cell phone. So I don't have a screen to look at. But hello, everyone. My name is Marine Lees. Uh, I'm from New York originally, but I am currently practicing as an associate in Wake Forest, North Carolina, just outside of Raleigh. And I graduated from San Antonio in 2017. And I have no pets. So nothing exciting to share there. But excited to be a part of the group. <laughs> Nice. It's not mandatory, so you're still inviting. And it's and it's wake for <laughs> wake for smiles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll go. I just yes. how to unmute. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh no! Now I can't hear any of you. We can hear you. <laughs> we can see you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. I'll just talk because I can't hear you guys anymore. But I'm Alexa McEnany. I'm a deep right. student um, at Roseman University in Salt Lake City. I'm originally from Southern Utah. Um, I don't have a dog right now either because I don't have a yard and I love dogs. So I claim my sister's Dalmatians, Owen and Bennett, as <laughs> my nephew puppies. Um, yeah, that's me. Cool. Very Good. cool. Thanks. And Alexa, Alexa assisted uh, oh, at our yeah, course this last weekend. Okay. So it was fun oh. to spend time with her. Yeah, this weekend was awesome. Yeah. Okay. Who, who hasn't gone yet? Um, Kids. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi, Dr. Hornbrook. And hello, Kirti. Uh, my name is Kirti. I live in Buffalo, New York. Um, I did my dental school, graduated in 2016 and did one year of residency like almost two years for me and i always want to do uh, want to learn more about aesthetic cases and i was really looking forward for like one of the great course so i really uh, i feel really awesome that shashi my husband he works for ivoclar and he met dr hornbrook and i knew he's like one of the big people in doing aesthetic cases and i'm like really excited to for you to be my mentor and guide me further to learn about those cases. Yeah, but thank you so much. Good, it'll be fun. To it to it. Yeah, tell Sashi I said hi. Sashi uh, mm -hmm. is, is a very, very good friend of mine, works for Iva Clark in their, in their R&D and their scientific department. Good guy, so yeah. tell him hi. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. I'm glad you're here. Okay, uh, Ch Cherish, have you gone yet? I haven't, can you okay. hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I don't know how to work the video, but it works out better this way. <laughs> My name's Cherish. I'm at Roseman. Alexa and I are classmates. We're fourth year dental students. And I heard about this course from Dr. Howard, who knows Dr. Hornbrook pretty well. And we I just heard a lecture he gave last Thursday, which is really good. And I look forward to this course. I have two Pomeranian dogs. What? They, uh, <laughs> very barky, but super cute. That is fantastic. Very mm -hmm. good. Yeah, so, so Stuart, for, for my, bir my birthday was last Thursday, and I worked in the lab all day. And then for, for myself, my present to myself, I spoke to the, the dental school for three hours. Had a great time. Hey, happy birthday. That's great. Yeah, good happy birthday, Dr. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. Well, I'm kidding a little Lord, bit, like but it was, it was a lot yourself. of fun. It was really a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, I think we just have one person, uh, but I don't know who you are. Gemalina in the middle. I don't know if that's your real name. or. Hello, okay. can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, hey, I'm Eddie Molina. Eddie, okay, perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, I'm from Fresno. Um, I found out about the program through um, – Couple people. One was Steve went to the Tops course. Another one was my mentor, and then at the Coy Center. Um, I graduated from UCSF back in '15. Um, been practicing for four years now. Um, have my own practice, 
And yeah, I'm looking through some aesthetic cases and get into it, you know, big time. So looking forward to it. Very cool. Cool. Okay. Was that everybody? I think it is. Okay. So uh, just a couple of things. I just wanted to do like house, uh, house cleaning items before we move forward. Um, one, one thing that I think is really fun is that um, inside the Crown Council, our, our members, uh, the doctors become really good friends. And this is a really fun opportunity for you guys to connect not only with Dr. Hornbrook and the mentors, but to connect with each other and hopefully start a friendship that um, is across the country. But that, that shouldn't matter. Um, you guys can connect with each other uh, at the meetings and through everything that Crown Council does. It's, it's one of the great parts of this program is to bring you guys together. Um, so thank you for introducing you know, yourselves and to be part of the group. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about before Dr. Hornbrook had, he did get some questions from you, is I want to talk about the case selection uh, that you've been asked to do and just kind of ask if you have any questions about uh, what you're supposed to be working on for the case selection. Um, it is the program itself, is the cases that you bring to the table. Um, and so I hope that you take it very seriously. Uh, we're not looking for necessarily the biggest and baddest cases that you can find. We're looking for a case that we can all learn from and have a really fun result and change the life of somebody who normally wouldn't have the opportunity to have this experience. Uh, Crown Council will pay for the <clears throat> patient to come to Salt Lake for the two weekends. Utah Valley Dental Lab donates all of the materials and David donates his time. So this patient is taken care of from front, you know, from the from the front to the end as an experience for the Young Dentist program. Um, so th does anybody have any questions about the case and, and what you're looking for, how it's supposed to be submitted? Um, any, any, any questions for David and I? Can, David, can, I, add, can I add to that? Yeah, any, any uh, suggestions or thoughts yeah, you have on the so case? So, you know, the one thing, it's, it's, it, again, it's about the experience, but it's really the story of the patient. And you could have a great case and it could be your sister, but the story isn't as, as good as someone that maybe couldn't afford it. It's going to radically change their life. And so I would, I would urge you, for those that have not, to go back to previous either YouTube videos or what's the best place for them to see previous years, Stuart? YouTube? Yeah, so... Um... On the Crown Council YouTube page, there's multiple years of the Young Dentist Program's results posted. So, um, yeah, you, you can just go to Crown Council's YouTube channel and watch, um, I think, five years, six years back of the patient reveal and, and kind of the, the story of the patient. Yeah, it, 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 it is very, very cool. <clears throat> and we've been fortunate to, to change some, some incredible lives, and, and it's been really rewarding. So, um, for those that don't know the process, basically you have the opportunity to find the patient. And again, it needs to be a two visit procedure. So it can't be something where they need 10 implants and then they need to integrate. You know, it's, it's an eight to 10 unit maxillary anterior case. You know, gotta make sure they have posterior teeth because we've gotten some, some entries where, you know, it would be a good case, but they don't have any back teeth. I can't really do aesthetics on the front unless there's back teeth. Um, we don't incorporate any removable into this. So we're looking at, you know, short teeth, wear, spacing, discoloration, old restorations. We can do missing teeth, but it's going to be a bridge, not an implant. Um, so just, just envision that, you know, you, you saw your patient, they went through perio, they're periodontally healthy, mm -hmm. and now they need some restorative to look better. I mean, I, that's how I want you to think about the process. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> you'll, you'll, put that together and, and in the instructions, I want perio, I want photographs, and we sent you a copy of the photographs that I need, uh, radiographs, and the story about this patient. And you can either send that as JPEGs, and I'll put it in a PowerPoint, or you can put it in a PowerPoint, and then I'll just transfer it to my PowerPoint. The thing I don't want is PDFs of the photos, because I'm going to be making a PowerPoint, which means I've got to go to that PDF, crop every single photo, transfer it to my PowerPoint. And if I get 50 entries, I mean, that's a, a long process. And, and so it just makes it easier for me if you can do it as JPEGs. 
Mm -hmm. um, I would prefer Dropbox versus Gmail, but Dropbox will be okay. You can do it as a PowerPoint. Do not do it as a keynote because I I'm going to be using PowerPoint. So keynote the same thing. I've got to go in there and I've got to cut out that picture and transfer it over. And it gets kind of tedious. And so you guys can really help me out if if, if you do that. Um, the you know, karyo charting can be a um, a PDF. The other thing on radiographs, instead of sending me one radiograph at a time, if you could send it as a full mouth or bite wings or a pano. Again, otherwise I have to go to every single one of those pictures and I have to make a full mouth on my slide. So things like that can just help me out. And mm -hmm. then what we do is I take that PowerPoint, we're gonna meet in the end of January in Nashville. We'll meet for six hours, we have three two hour visits and you present your case. And even if it's a case that we don't choose, we, we talk about treatment planning and, and I help you with that as we move forward. <clears throat> and then at the end of that six hours, you as a group, I don't even vote, but you as a group vote on which patient you would like for me to treat. And so that's why I say the story is really powerful because most of, the, most of the, the attendees would like their patient to attend and, and be the one chosen. But lots of times it's, it's someone else's patient the story is better and so i just want you to keep that in mind yeah the, and the neat the neat part that we've seen in the past david and you can add to this if you want um is that when the stories are presented i would say that the story is more powerful than the case so uh, oftentimes if like last year there was a there was a story about this ups man <clears throat> who was like endeared to the practice. You know, they loved this guy and he would come in and he'd been, he'd been the UPS man for 20 or 30 years. Um, and they really wanted to do something nice for him. I can't remember what happened. Maybe the, the case didn't work out, but the story was so touching. Uh, you could imagine uh, one of the cases we've done in the past, it was a, was a fireman, you know, a local man who hadn't smiled for 20 or 30 years. He was just you know, in his profession, he was like, you know, whatever, I just, I don't smile. I it doesn't, it's not a big deal. And then, you know, David and the team brought this man to tears when he saw his smile for the first time. So yeah. um, it really is a cool thing to find that story and find that patient whose life can really be changed by this little program. So, yeah. And, and surprisingly, the men have always been the most emotional. <clears throat> Our men patients, which we've had three now over the last 20 years. And they're the ones that kind of bring everyone to tears because, because of how it changed their life. And so don't rule out that middle-aged man that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, struggling a little bit with his self-image and self-worth because those are great patients. Okay. okay. Any questions now about the SMILE program? No. No? Is there an age requirement for the patient? Like, I have a teenager that might be a good candidate. <clears throat> teenage age like 13 like or like 19 if, like 16. if they're fully grown so there's a male or a female female <clears throat> so as, as long as their growth plates are complete so mm -hmm. what i would like in a situation like that is to have at least an orthodontic orthodontist look at a stuff to see whether they feel that the growth plates are finished um you know we hate to go in there and close all the spaces or whatever and all of a sudden their maxilla grows and we got spaces again. So, you know, 16 for a female is pretty doable. If it was a male, I would probably wait. Um, okay. That, I just want to make sure that they're fully grown. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Next you. Step. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Questions on the, on the photos. Cause David is going to just, he's going to grab all of your presentations and he has to build this in his kind of his spare time at night because uh, he he puts it together in a in a in a PowerPoint that we all watch and we learn from and then we vote on so uh, the the plea is is to make the pictures uh, as easy to work with as possible that's why PDFs are no good yeah the other thing too and, and I know some of you don't have good um, DSLR cameras but the photos do make a difference you know if, if, even if your patient has a great story if it's like a Polaroid or an iPhone photo that's blurry and you can't really see the message, I mean, that's almost like a strike against that patient. Oh, yeah, the trees maxed out. 
So if we can uh, try to get as good of photos as you can, if you have to borrow a camera. Again, we sent you the instructions, the photos that I would like, and, and including the f-stop and the size. So good pictures will certainly help your cause. Um, again, I know some of you are in situations, associates, or just haven't bought a good camera, and I, I know that may be difficult. But just try to do the best you can on quality of photos. Great. Um, okay. Uh, somebody's phone, I don't know, maybe it's David's, maybe it's mine, I don't know, but if you, um, I'm picking up something, I don't know if everyone else is, but if you're not talking, uh, maybe yeah. just, maybe just mute yourself, uh, just in case you're picking up background or something weird. Um, okay, so one other thing before I turn the time fully over to David, which is, uh, the Crown Council's filled with a thousand doctors from the last 25, last 25 years, the, the, the group has been growing. And the idea behind the Young Dentist program is there are mentors in the group who are willing to provide and teach. They, they want to teach the young dentists. And so um, D David is the first who uh, obviously is willing to come on and teach and share. But I will try to craft a program here where when, when we meet here, I'll pick mentors who are um, excited, happy to share with you, who've reached a point in their life where they really want to give and do good to you. So if you have someone you want to hear from, or if there's somebody that, uh, something that you really want to learn from, I have a lot of uh, businesses, or if we want to hear from other doctors, uh, young doctors or old doctors, uh, associate, I mean, there really is the sky's the limit here. If there's people that you guys want to hear from and, and talk to, I'd like to cater it to what you want and what you want to learn from. So um, David did get some questions for tonight. David, if you want to start, um, yeah, I only, I, I, I only got three, three people sent in questions unless, unless I missed it, but, uh, we'll go through these. I'll kind of read the questions. Some of them, they would be really long answers for, for this hour, but at least we can touch on them. Okay. Um, everyone, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, Cherish had sent me some, some questions and I'll just read the questions and then answer them and, and you know, to the best that I can. First question was, why is a buildup material used versus a composite, you know, for a buildup and core? Um, there's a lot of reasons. One is, probably number one is, is the ability that most buildup material are, are dual cured. So you can fill it up in bulk, whether it be a matrix or a crown former. You can cure it to start the set, and it really has an unlimited depth of cure. And so that's also important if it's on a posterior tooth down in, in a chamber that you're building up the core and the buildup at the same time. Um, you know, you can get with the dual cure, you can get complete polymerization. The other thing is these, most of these flowable core materials we're also using as a cement for posts. So in the anterior, I don't use posts in the posterior, but in the anterior, especially with a fiber reinforced post, I can actually put my bonding agent, inject my flowable core material down into the post hole, go ahead and place my post, and then build up my core so it's all one material. So you're not using a cement and a core. So that's a huge advantage. The second reason is cost. You know, if you took Herculite or Empress Direct and you tried to build this big buildup, I mean, you'd go through three or four compule tips and a quarter of the syringe. It would be prohibitive for you to use a composite material. Um, that would be number two. And Number three really would be flowable, flowability as well. I think, again, the ability to, to inject, a, and I'm a fan of a flowable core material. Um, there's a lot on the market, multi-core from uh, Ivoclar, there's um, Luxacore from DMG. I mean, there's a lot of them on the market, and they're all, I think, equally as, as good. But the ability to be able to inject it in undercuts and around a post or around an existing cusp I think there's a huge advantage over packing it and then having to limit, you know, two millimeters of depth of, of depth of cure, then adding a new increment, a new increment, a new increment. And I think lastly, the manufacturers have designed these core materials, these build-up materials, to prep more like dentin versus enamel. So that as you as you prep your buildup with the preparation, you know, you're not digging into your dentin or digging into your buildup because the surface toughness is a totally different um, sensation or tactile sensation. So I think that's another reason. You certainly could use 
a composite. I, I just think it's expensive to do that. Um, second one is, does the buildup material last longer? And no, it's not going to be lasting longer. It's really for, for the reasons that um, I just mentioned. Is the buildup material used because it's cheaper? Again, that's one of the four reasons I would say. What do you consider when choosing a stump shade or a prep shade? And I'd like for you guys to get in the habit of calling it a prep um, versus stump. And, and stump was actually the, the German word for prep. And that's why it was called that because Iva Clark came up with the stump shade guide and they're in Liechtenstein. And then when it got transferred over here, we just called it stump. And sometimes, you know, I, I hear it in my live patient courses all the time where you know, a dentist will say in front of their patient, we're now going to take your stump shades. And the patient freaks out because they didn't think they had stumps. They thought they were getting conservative veneers. So try to get in the habit of calling it prep, um, prep shade. And, you know, what we really need to do is we need to use Ivoclar shade guide for that if you're using Emphos or Emax. Um, it used to be called the stump shade, dye, shade guide. Now it's called the ND, the natural dye guide. Um, which is better because it's value based and the important thing is and the way the lab uses that is They will actually make a representation of your prep out of this Prep material stump dye material and it's a flexible resin. So they'll put it in your restoration They'll usually put a, either a metal or a clear plastic stick into that. They'll cure it so then what they will have is they will have a dye that represents what the prep is in the mouth and you know you're going to learn more about this later but there's three factors that affect the final shade of the restoration and that's the restored material itself the more opaque it is the more influence it'll have the more translucent it is the less influence the second factor is the prep itself especially if you use again a veneer or a very translucent anterior crown you're going to be able to see that prep through that restoration and that'll give that three-dimensionality and and that, that natural appearance. And then the third factor is the cement, the shade of the cement, to really the lessest degree of those three. So if you're ordering an Empress or an Emax that's translucent, the lab needs to know what that prep shade is. And so again, they'll pour it up if you said it was gonna, your prep shade was an ND3, again, they would make a dye ND3, then they would choose the material based on how thick the restoration is again a thin veneer it could be a thick crown they'll choose the opacity of the restored material so that that prep influence will give the final shade and then they'll do their final custom staining with that restoration on the prep dye so it's really important you, you know I part of my I have a practice in San Diego and I'm also the clinical director of education at Utah Valley Dental Lab so I spent a lot of time at the lab and a very frequent phone call I'll make is, what's the prep shade? And if the dentist says, I have no idea, and they're unwilling to have the patient back, take off the temporary and take a shade, which none of us like to do, then we really have to go with an opaque material, which is kind of you know counter to what we're trying to do with our lifelike vital looking restorations. So make sure you take a prep shade. And so that's for Emacs, Empress, if you're using Lisi from GC. Um, also, if you're using any of the HT zirconia, you know, a lot of you have incorporated monolithic zirconia in your practices. If you're using one of the HT, high translucency, I want you to treat it like you would Emacs because the translucency of that zirconia will allow that prep shade to come through as well. So those three materials, just buy the shade guide. You can call a lab and get it, or you can get it directly from Iva Clark. Again, it's called the ND Shade Guide or Prep Shade Guide. Um, the next one was, would you recommend every crown case sent to the lab include photos? Do you send photos of the buckle and occlusal views? It depends on you know, how closely you want this to match the adjacent teeth. You know, if it's a second molar and, and, it's, it's, and I'm gonna use Vita Shade, shade uh, Nomenclature just because it's familiar to you, although not many people use Vita shade guides anymore, but let's say it was somewhere between, you know, a Vita two and, and, and a three, like halfway, and it's, you can't see it. You know, a photo isn't a big deal, but it's only gonna take you 15 minutes, and that's going to make your good dentistry great. I mean, even on 
a, you know, a second molar on the upper arch, you know, it doesn't cost any more to have a crown that really blends into the adjacent teeth than one that is kind of close. And so I recommend if a tooth is visible at all, just take a photograph, just take it with a shade tab. Again, I'll tell you another thing, being having a relationship with the ceramists I do, ceramists are very visual. They like photographs. They would prefer a photograph versus you just saying it's a little lighter than A3, a little darker than A2 or something like that. As far as occlusal views, again, the same thing. If you want it to look like the adjacent teeth or the adjacent restorations, then take photos. And I like to take photos of a natural tooth in the arch. I'll just grab my uh, intraoral mirror, I'll just shoot a photo and I'll say match this. And that way the lab can really see what, what you mean when you may say medium brown staining in primary grooves only, or white hy hypocalcifications up the marginal ridges. You know, they can visualize that, but if they can actually see a photo of that, that's just gonna take your good dentistry and make it great dentistry. So early in your career, one of the best advices I could give you is buy a good camera, take lots of photos, and we're gonna get into that a little later as well, but of restorations, of, of preps or adjacent teeth or adjacent restorations that you're trying to match. If it's an anterior tooth, absolutely multiple photographs with different shade guides so if there's multiple shades within that tooth i would want a photograph of each of those multiple shades with that shade tie, shade tab in the photo so that they can really see the relationship of that part of the tooth to the shade guide and the importance of a photo with anterior teeth especially is that it's not only the shade but it's the transition between the shades you know it's one thing just to take a piece of paper and and color map it you know on a black and white with a pencil and then mark where you know where those should be and the shades where those different areas are but the ceramics cannot see the transitions between the shades so good photographs make sure that if you take a, a photograph of the shade tab that they can see the marking in the shade tab it's very frequent that we will get a nice photo with a shade tab, but I can't, we can't see the letter of the shade tab on it. So it kind of doesn't do us any good. I mean, it could be really any shade tab. So get in the habit of taking photos. <clears throat> You'll develop a better relationship with your ceramist. <clears throat> also the ceramist, if they know that you're trying to do the best dentistry that you can by including information and good photos, they're gonna deliver a better restoration. So get in the habit of doing that. Um, I would like to see Dr. Hornbrook's lad slip and how he words things. So my email address is david at hornbrook.com. Um, feel free to email me and just say, hey, can you shoot me a copy of some of your lab slips? David at hornbrook.com. Because I have, um, that's a real common request in my lectures. And I'll send two or three. I'll send a wax up. I'll send a posterior. I'll send an implant abutment. And I'll send an anterior smile design. My lab slips are not check the box lab slips. They're actually written out and I address all the variables and it's really detailed. And probably when you first see it, you're gonna say, wow, this is a lot more detailed than, than mine. Um, and it's just because of experience. And so get in the habit of what I call addressing the variables. You know, even on a single tooth, there's so many variables. So on a smile design, there's so many variables. Surface texture, and size of ledge, amount and translucency, length, relationship to the adjacent teeth, polychromacity versus monochromacity. So think about all the variables and make sure that you include that in your lab slip. And again, when you get mine, you'll see that. You know, when, when I send a case to the lab, and it, I talked a lot about this this weekend, my primary goal is not to get a phone call. Because if I get a phone call, that means I either left something out or they have no idea what I meant by what I did say. And the problem with saying, well, I don't mind if they call me, the problem is you don't answer the phone in a timely manner. I say you, not pointing at one of you, not you, Stuart. I'm pointing at us as a profession. They're on a timeline. They've got a schedule just like we have a schedule. And if you want a case back in a, a time that you expect that because you're seeing that you're seeding that case and you're missing something and the laboratory calls you and it could be as, as stupid as they didn't get an opposing. That happens all the time. They didn't get a stick bite. They didn't get a shade. I mean, whatever it is, 
you don't answer the phone, they call the next day, you don't answer the phone, your receptionist says, I'll make sure I'll give them the message, and they'll get back with you. Three days later, finally you get back with them. Now it's too late for them to do that case correctly and get it back to you on time. So two parts of that message is try to avoid the phone call. Second is tell your receptionist, whoever's answering the phone, that if the lab calls about a case, to make sure they give you the message right away. Or if you work with a certain ceramist, give them your cell phone. Like my ceramist has my cell phone. So I could be on vacation in Puerto Rico, like Chelsea, or I could be on a plane and I could get that message. I could be able to answer that in a timely manner versus waiting until I get back and seeing the little one of 150 sticky notes on my computer that I've got to answer. So good question. Feel free, David at Hornbrook.com. All right, Kit, you said, I would like to discuss treatment planning phases and case selection. And I didn't know if you meant the case selection for this course or just overall. That, that was you, Kit? Kit, that did that. Was that your question? Yes, yes. I would like to know, like, how uh, you select the patients, like, how you talk to the patient, communicate with them, what are your cases of choice, like, if somebody like me, if I have not done any um, aesthetic cases where I should start seeing those patients, what to look for. I know it's very yeah. deep, but. Yeah, that, I mean, that is detailed. And, you know, the number one is <clears throat> you have to feel confident that you can do that case, mm -hmm. right? You know, if, if a builder came to your house <clears throat> and was going to put a pool in and you said, mm -hmm. you know, I want it over there. I want it to look like this. I want a diving board. You know, I want a little kid's area and a jacuzzi. And they mm -hmm. said, um, you know, I, I've never done that one. Maybe, I mean, you'd never hire that pool builder, right? Yes. And if the pool builder said, are you kidding? This is going to be awesome. You know, I would actually put a slide too, maybe a little rock slide because of the angle and the slope of your backyard. You know, if they were confident, you're going to accept that bit, right? Yeah. And they could both really be good. They could be even different or the same prices, but it's the confident of that second, that second builder is the reason you chose them, right? So number one is you have to have experience, and that's the tough one for young dentists. You gotta have the experience to be able to say, I can do this, right? Now, at this point in your career, I, I would try to read as much as you can in, in to get case, just to understand how people are treatment planning cases. You know, this would be journals, whether it be Inside Dentistry or Dentistry Today or the, the Journal of the American Academy, Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. I mean, whatever it is, try to just understand why did they make the decisions that they did. Okay. Also, find mentors. You know, a lot of you have good mentors, and it, it, it could be a dental school instructor that you just kind of bonded with. could be a dentist that you work with now, um, that you associate with, or maybe another dentist that's in the office that maybe is an associate as well that has done more cases. Mm -hmm. is take these cases, again, good photos, good records and try to help someone else help you treat it. Have someone help you treatment plan these cases, right? So the, the other thing is that you need to be excited. You know, I have a couple sayings and, and you'll, you'll hear all my crazy sayings as we get to know each other in the next six years. But one of my crazy sayings is enthusiasm equals credibility, mm -hmm. right? And so as I talk to my patient, it's like, I'm fired up about it. You know, it's like, this mm -hmm. is going to, awesome i mean look at them i mean this is going to be crazy good you yeah. know in, in california we can say bitchin right mm -hmm. a lot of states in buffalo maybe you can't say bitchin but we can say <laughs> uh, especially in southern california right um but you know just being excited about it and, and you know i call it the fast moving train to paradise mm -hmm. as you're talking about the case and the final result the patients sense that excitement and the mm -hmm. only way they're going to feel that excitement, <clears throat> so they can say, sense your excitement, your treatment coordinator or your dental assistant, they can sense that. The mm -hmm. only way that they're going to ever experience that is to accept treatment. Yes. Right? And so be enthusiastic about it. Um, study as much as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, to be educated is, you know, this, 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 this course will radically help you move forward. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about prep design, um, mm -hmm. cementation. We're going to talk a little bit about occlusion. So we're going to talk about things that will give you that confidence. And then the next That's step would be our occlusion course. 
and mm-hmm. our live patient course that we just did this weekend where you're prepping and then you have a mentor and you have me there that helps you with that case and it just gives you the confidence to move forward. So, you know, again, at this point in your career, try to get as much information so you can go in and say, I've seen this, maybe I've never done it, mm-hmm. but I've seen it and I understand why they made those decisions, right? And mm-hmm. then be confident, yeah. you know, even if, even if you're scared to death, be confident. You know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, when I first started, I'd go in and say, oh, this is going to be awesome. Patient would leave and I'd go into my office and say, how the heck do I do this? What do I do now? You know, and then you would contact your mentor and your dental laboratory. I can't stress that enough. Most of you work either by yourself or with a couple, two or three other doctors. Mm -hmm. You know, your dental laboratory works with, well, I'm going to use Utah Valley Dental Lab as an example. And that's a great resource for you. You know, Mm -hmm. they work with, 250 dentists that have done everything. So even to the point of saying, I have this case and you have a model whether you scan it or you just took an impression, Mm. what material should I use? How should I prep it? They Mm. will do that for you because they've seen successes and failures. And I think dental school is, is kind of kind of divided the the lab world from the clinician world Mm. and not really made it. So, I mean, this should be a collaborative effort right from the very beginning right from the beginning. And so utilize that. So I hope I answer that as as much as I could. And that kind of goes into your, your next, any ideas about how to communicate with patients? Um, when you discuss models and photos, one is to take photos that, so they can really see what's going on, take impressions. Um, so they can visually see that. Um, if you don't have a good camera, intraoral photos with an intraoral camera, they can see visually. Right. And then, as you're discussing a treatment, so let's say you have a, a patient that wants a nicer smile and you think, you know what, I can do this. I can do this with, in your case, maybe your husband's help, my help, a mentor's help, the lab's help. You feel that you can do this. At that point, we're going to talk a lot about this in the, in the summertime, is I want to get you into a mindset that you say when, W-H-E-N versus if. So I would say, kids, when I see you again, or when we design your smile, or the materials that we are going to use, you're going to, you're going to look in the mirror and wish you had done this five years ago. This is going to be so cool, right? Not, let's meet again, and if you decide to commit to treatment, what we will do, it's just up front. You know, we would have a consult if you were in my office right now, and I would say, I know you want to close this space here. That's going to be so cool. The other thing we're going to do is, you notice your midline is off a little bit. I'm going to upright it. The other thing I'd like to do is I'm going to bring this out. I'm going to brighten your teeth, right? I'm already motivating and moving you forward. And I haven't even talked about cost, number of visits, how many teeth, but you're, you're already kind of moving forward with me, right? So when, instead of if, okay, Mm -hmm. that really, because a patient wants to be part of it, right? And like what you're doing right now, you're mirroring, I'm mirroring you, you know, you're nodding, right? And that's what the patient will do. If the patient says, oh, yes, and you mirror that patient or they're mirroring you, that's moving them forward. Because, you know, they want someone they're confident in. They want someone that cares about them. Um, I want you to think about a, a smile design or even a full mouth rehab or, you know, whatever it is, it's going to, again, we're talking about cosmetics. Anything that's going to improve their self-image or self-worth, that's a gift, right? That's a gift to them because there's not many people in their life, maybe a plastic surgeon, that mm-hmm. can give them a gift that they can feel better about themselves, right? So if yeah. we sit and talk to our patient and instead of thinking, you know, this is going to increase my bonus or my production is going to go up or now I can buy the new motorcycle that I've always wanted, you know, it's more, you know, I'm giving this patient a gift. And yeah, I'm going to get paid for that, but let's not even think about that right now. Let's just think about the gift that I'm giving the patient and as I give that gift, you're going to get a gift back when they look at the mirror at the end and say, wow, thank you, Dr. Gitz, right? But mindset, mindset. Good questions. Thank you. Um, Nick, um, you said, I've yet to have a patient walk in and tell me they want 10 crowns or veneers. So how to effectively communicate with patients on not only showing them a problem they didn't know they had, but then moving them forward with treatment. All right, let's talk a little bit about that. Because, you know, I'm in a position now, patients may come in and say, I want veneers. They may not say, I want 10 veneers. 
but they know they want a new smile. So one thing is, and a lot of you maybe are just in, in general practices, and again, you're trying to in, improve or increase the number of aesthetic-based cases that you're doing, is one is you need to plant seeds. And the first one is on your health history form. Because I would guarantee not all of you, and maybe I'm wrong, but I would, I would almost guarantee it, that not all of you ask every single patient if there's anything they would like to change about their smile. And if you don't ask them, there's a good chance no one ever asked them. And if you don't ask them, you know, they're not going to answer the question. My favorite quote of all time, and I expect for you guys to remember this since you're seven, I'm sharing with this early. Uh, my favorite quote of all time is Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. 100% of the shots you don't take. So the first place we're going to ask them is on the health history form. On our health history form, it says, if you could wave a magic wand, is there anything you'd like to change about your smile? And that's easy, right? So people say, I wish they were younger. I wish they were whiter. Um, I wish I didn't have these spaces. I wish they were longer. I mean, that automatically gives you an opening to say, hey, I just read on your health history form that you're interested in whiter teeth or longer teeth or closing your spaces or getting rid of the old crown. That gives you a place to start that conversation because they give you permission. The second question I would have on your health history form is, if you could safely and easily whiten your teeth, would you be interested? I mean, that's easy, right? Not all of you, I would, I would doubt, all of you ask your patients if they would like to whiten their teeth. And, and that's such a gift too. I mean, a patient's gone through ortho, they have nice teeth, but they're yellow. I mean, whitening is a huge gift. But they have to check that box on my health history form, just like they would if they had a heart attack or HIV or any other part of the health history form. They have to check a box. And if they put yes, basically what that is doing, it's opening the door for you to say, let's talk about your smile. The other thing I would do is, so let's say they put nothing. And a lot of times it's men, because we don't like to always share that maybe we're dissatisfied with the way they look, or we don't always care unless someone brings it up. Let's give an example. Let's say Travis is in, in my chair and I'm doing a, a full new patient exam. And he didn't put anything under that if you could wave a magic wand. And he checked, yeah, I'd like to whiten my teeth. All right, so I'm giving him an exam and he's got a PFM on tooth number eight. I'm very visual, so I think the rest of the world is visual too. I would hand him a mirror, I would say, how do you feel about this front crown? It's kind of technology that we used to use with metal that we don't use so much anymore. Does, does that bother you at all? And you would say, no, nah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, great. I mean, clinically, I'm looking at the x-ray. I'm looking at it with my Explorer. Everything looks good, but materials have changed. If you ever wanted to do anything about it, I'm here for you. And I leave it at that. All right? An amalgam. I'm on tooth number four that's dark. Does that, that old, a mercury filling that shows, does that bother you aesthetically? Ah, uh, no, it's fine. Okay, well, just let me know. The materials we use now, I would take that out. It would be all tooth colored, bonds to the tooth. You know, you wouldn't show that. And, you know, that filling's fine now, but if there's anything you'd ever like to do, I'm here for you, right? They don't say anything. I keep going and, and charting, whether it's perio charting or, or restoration charting. <clears throat> Nine times out of 10, especially guys, Travis, who said, ah, it doesn't bother me. <clears throat> when I'm done with my exam, they say, tell me about, like, talk to me about this tooth again. <laughs> what, what can you do? Because I asked them, probably no other dentist, or maybe it was you in the past, ever asked them because it was clinically acceptable. I don't think aesthetically acceptable, but clinically acceptable. So don't be afraid to ask. Plant seeds. You know, a lot of you don't have your own office, but some of you just started your own office. Uh, I forget who it was in, in Fresno. Is one of my pet peeves is walking into a dental office, especially aesthetic based practice, and have no idea that you do anything to improve someone's self worth and making them feel and look better. You know, I don't want to come in and see, well, again, this is for you, Stuart. I don't want to see a bunch of pictures of the national parks in Utah and the walls in your reception room or down your hallway. It's beautiful, but that 
it could be an insurance office, it could be a car dealership, it could be a financial planner, but that's not the message we want to tell these patients. I want to see beautiful pictures, after pictures, before and after books. I want to, I want to be able to walk into a room and say, wow, this person does something that has to do with beauty. I mean, you think about a high-end um, beauty salon. What do they have on the walls? They have attractive people with nice hairstyles. You, know, you just go in and you know, whether you look around and say, I want that hairstyle, or I want to look like this person, or I want to look like that, or I need to make a change. You know exactly what they do for a living. So I want you to think about that a little bit. The other thing is the magazines and books in your reception room. I don't have People Magazine or Sports Illustrated or Reader's Digest or Highlights because that does nothing to promote what I do for a living. I have before and after books on my cocktail, my cocktail table in my reception room so that they pick that up. They're looking at the before and afters. And maybe they can relate and say, wow, my wife has a crown like that, or that kind of looks like my tooth, and look how nice it looks now. The other thing I, I like in my reception area is a nice leather-bound book with thank you notes or testimonials from other patients. So if you have a patient that says, man, I just, I just you're the best dentist ever. I love my new smile. I love coming here. I love coming here. I love coming here. Something happened. Um, I just, I say, would you mind just on your letterhead, if maybe when you get to work, would you mind just writing us a thank you note? Because I have patients that, that would like to know about how you felt with your experience with me. And they always want to do it. And so now our patients, instead of picking up People Magazine said, or Golf Digest, they're reading, because they're reading, because they're interested in it. They're reading all these little thank you notes and testimonials of what other patients that have seen me, their positive experience. And your patients want to be associate, associated with a successful dentist. They want to go in there and say, someone else has had treatment done by this dentist and I'm thinking about treatment. So I want you to go in tomorrow. I want you to look around. Again, some of you will have no control of your office. But what message? Going through your front door. You know, I, again, that's another thing. A lot of you go through the back door and haven't been in your reception area in maybe months, maybe a year. You know, what is the patient perception of what you do for a living as they walk through the door? Okay, so plant seeds. You, know, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. All right, um, I hope that helped. How do you design occlusion? I see a lot of heavy wear cases and communicate with labs to ensure long-lasting restorations. That's a long question. That's, that's a weekend course. Um, you know, we, we, we have to understand where that wear is coming from. and. Again, dental, a lot of you are, are young dentists, right? Even a couple of years out of school. Quite frankly, the occlusion courses you learned in dental school are not very practical and they're not really related to restorative dentistry. So the, the bit of advice I would give you here, it, you know, first I'd, I'd recommend that you take um, Mark Montgomery and my occlusion course. It's two and a half days. It's very, very practical. It'll answer all these questions. And it's very affordable access for, for young dentists because you get a discount. You could um, you could email me about that as well, and I'll tell you when the when the next location is. We do it on one on the East Coast in Virginia, Northern Virginia. We do one in Utah, um, two in Utah a year, one on the East Coast. But the the big question is, anytime you see anterior wear, I want you to ask yourself, why is there wear? And I don't care what material you use to try to correct that, that, that pathology. If you don't understand the source of it, you're gonna have failed restorations, which is almost worse than treating it at all. And something that dental school doesn't talk about much, although you learned a little bit about CRCO interferences, and that's fulcruming interference in the posterior that caused the patient to posture their mandible forward when they swallow and they hit on front teeth. And I want you to start looking in your own practice where you've got patients that have a lot of anterior wear and no posterior wear. You're going to see that. And instead of saying, aha, they're a bruxer, I mean, they're not a bruxer. Otherwise, they would have a bunch of wear in the posterior. These are patients that have a fulcruming interference. And that's a CR, so CRCO interference that is causing anterior destruction because they're avoiding that interference. So we use deprogrammers, we get, you know, we call a physiological bite. 
um, let the muscles drive the bite and we balance out the, the interferences. So again, that's, and I hope that didn't confuse you more than, than actually answer the question, but you no, need I, to I didn't expect thinking. you to answer this, you know, comprehensively yeah. tonight. I, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's a tough, a good question, but I just, you know, the other thing I see a lot too is when they do have wear in the posterior and they have short teeth in the anterior and they want a nicer smile. And, you know, we see doctors that say, oh yeah, we'll do veneers. We'll do eight veneers or six or 10 veneers um, because you, your teeth are short. But if they have flat molars, you can't build an ideal anterior aesthetics when they're cows. And I say cows because, you know, our job, we're really supposed to be rats. You know, if you look at molars, unworn molars, sharp cusp, deep fossa. You look at the way our jaw is designed, it's really vertical chewing. That's the way the teeth are designed. And if the patient has a lot of wear in the posterior and they've worn their anterior, they are not vertical chewers. They are lateral chewers, like a cow, right? And so they've got flat, worn teeth in the anterior, worn teeth in the posterior. So they are chewing like a cow. And then you go in and you put glass. And this could be zirconia, it could be Emacs, it could be Empress, it doesn't really matter what it is. You make them a rat in the anterior, a cow in the posterior, and they're still a lateral chewer because their back teeth just don't function. And they'll start destroying your anterior dentistry. So I, again, the one, the one bit of advice, I, again, I'm gonna go back and, and summarize that. Where did the pathology come from? Second is, if you have anterior wear, I want you to look at posterior teeth. What are those posterior teeth doing? Are they making that patient a cow or are they causing fulcruming interferences that's causing that patient to posture forward every time they swallow? Because they say we only touch our teeth, not when we're chewing, parafunction and swallowing. If you all swallow right now, your teeth come together. If there's a fulcruming or a posterior interference, your brain does not like that interference. It's usually it'll be second, always third molars. That's why we recommend third molars come out anytime we're doing cosmetic cases. But second molars, especially the mesial angul angulated second molars, you've seen those. So if they go to swallow and that distal of that second molar is in the way, the brain will, via muscle ingrams, it'll posture the mandible forward, and we don't think about it, posture it forward, hit on the front teeth, fly back 3,000 times a day. So the patient wears their anterior teeth, they have no destruction on their posterior teeth. And you go in there and say, aha, your teeth are short, let's do veneers. Without taking care of that fulcrum interference, when they swallow, they're going to hit your glass on the front. It could be bonding. They're going to hit your glass and they're going to break these beautiful anterior dentistry that you do because you didn't address the posterior. So, again, I just want you to think about how posterior teeth play in the role of anterior teeth. Um, cementation protocol for multiple units. Um, I don't do two at a time. I do everything at one time called the tack and wave. Um, Nick or any of you that are interested, I would urge you just to, I could probably find it, but it might just be as easy for you as to just to go to Google and look up Tack and Wave. I've written several articles in the last 20 years on it um, for inside dentistry, clinical dentistry, and it's a step-by-step -step with photos, which would be probably the best way. That's what we're gonna do next summer when we cement the case is all eight or 10, depending on how many we're gonna do at one time. Um, as far as materials, I, I want you to go to uvdl.com, uvdl.com, that's Utah Valley Dental Lab. I want you then to double, there'll be a menu at the top. I want you to click on resources and then click on cementation guides and Hornbrook resources. So there'll be two in the drop down menu, it'll, be, it'll say Hornbrook's resources, cementation guides. And these are PDFs, and so everything is free. The cementation guides, I have three cementation guides that are step-by-step -step how to cement bonded anterior restorations. So that would be veneers and crowns. That would be, I'm a total etcher, so that'd be either total etch or select etch, 
using a true resin adhesive cement and all ceramic restorations, step-by-step, step, including some recommendations of products within categories. So instead of just saying, use a bonding agent or, or use the bonding agent that I use, there'll be three or four that I like, step-by-step. Step. The second one is posterior adhesive cementation. Again, I, I believe if you say you're adhesively placing something, you've either got a total edge or you've got a select edge, not self edge. I do not believe self edge is true adhesive cementation. So posterior adhesive cementation would be inlays and onlays or ceramic crowns that don't have much retention. I think you need to replace that lack of retention with the prep with adhesion. And then the last one is non-adhesive cementation or looting. And that would be the zirconia crown with adequate retention, PFM, gold, and basically what I do step by step. So that'll answer a lot of the questions on cementation. And I think that'll help all of you. You know, it also addresses how to treat the restorative material because we treat Emacs and Empress much differently than we do zirconia. And so it addresses that. How do we prep the restoration for maximum, maximum adhesion? How do we prep the tooth for maximum adhesion? So those three guides. In the Hornbrook's resources, that would be another, same drop-down menu, just another thing you're going to click. I have a step-by-step -step how to take um, bite registrations on the full mouth rehabs, how we use a deprogrammer, how we segment and sequence these big cases. And the other one is step-by-step -step smile design. What are the sequences that start when the stork says, yes, I want a new smile, to the time that we polish and send them out the door. So again, those are all free, uvdl.com, go to resources, again, there's cementation guides and Hornbrook resources. And I think that'll answer a lot for you. And then if you want it visually, because um, those are just PDFs, just Google tack and wave technique or Hornbrook tack and wave technique and um, you could print that up and because and, it has photos. And lastly, material selection for restorations, cements and bonding agents, that'll be covered. What to use and why. But I'll tell you, I'll give you kind of the summary. For the anterior, I'm a huge Empress person. Um, I think Empress is absolutely just a gorgeous material. It's been on the market for 25 years. Um, you know, I'm looking at cases that I did in 1994. Um, this just still looks great. So when I design anterior smile designs, they're all Empress, all of them. If I redid mine today, they would be Empress. For single units in the anterior, or maybe a couple that are matching to existing dentition, I will use Emacs in the anterior for that. I just don't think Emacs looks as aesthetic in bright shades. And everyone, you know, if you did 10 veneers, they want a white shade. You know, B1 is a dark shade for most of these patients. You know, it's going to be a Z B000. I think Empress is just so much prettier than Emacs in white shades. But if you're doing more natural look, again, matching existing dentition of the patient says, no, I just want my teeth longer. I want them to look really natural. And you're not being, you're not doing a B0, something brighter than a B1. Emacs is fine for the anterior. Again, that's subjective. That's me just looking at my own dentistry over the last 25 years. And, you know, Emacs has been on the market 15 years now. And the cases that come into my office and just, you know, they just jump out at me and I say, wow, I love that case. All Empress, they're not Emacs. So again, I've gone back to strictly Emacs and, or and, uh, Empress in the anterior. For the posterior, most of my posterior restorations are Emacs, um, especially if they're onlays or inlays or kind of funky preps, um, just because I can bond to it very effectively and predictably. And I think they just look really good aesthetically. If it's a full coverage crown in the posterior, I will use one of the new HT Zirconia. And there's a lot of them on the market. You know, I like Lava Aesthetic. I like Ivoclar's, um, their um, MT, their Zircad is a pretty material. Your lab, whatever lab you use, you know, can make their recommendations. Um, we can bond to Zirconia. You know, there's people that say you can't bond to Zirconia. We can absolutely bond to Zirconia. Good studies, Nate Lawson has done some really cool stuff. University of Alabama, so we can bond to it. I just don't do inlays or onlays or 
non-retentive restorations in zirconia. Um, for bridges, I use zirconia. I'll do monolithic in the posterior. In the anterior, I'll do cutback and layered. So we have a framework, almost like a PFM framework, but it would be zirconia, and then it's overlaid with either Emacs or a powder liquid ceramic, like Noritake, something like that. So did that answer your question? That was Nick. Did that help at all? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, and that's again, that's my bias. You know, we could get someone else on here, and they'd say, "Oh, I use Zmax for everything." I just don't think it looks as good. And and you know, you talk to the ceramists. I did kind of a fun thing last summer. I sent uh, an email to fifteen master ceramists. Some of them were part of big labs. Some of them were just you know individual master ceramists that had their their lab in their home, literally. And I asked them a bunch of questions, but one of the questions was, you're sitting in my operatory, your 10 unit veneer case is on my bracket table. What would you like those to be made out of? All of them said Empress. Now when I asked them, what would they prefer to make someone else's out of? They said Emacs because it's easier to work with <laughs> and it's much more forgiving because it's stronger. But they would all say the Empress looks better. So, again, that's my bias and my subjectiveness, but hopefully that helps. So, those are all the only questions I got, unless I missed somebody, some from somebody that emailed me and I went into spam or, or junk mail. Is there anything you want to ask? We got a, maybe a couple more mo minutes. No? All right. I have a question. You, one, yeah, you raise your hand. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm happy to join on the video conference now, um, but I had a question, actually Wait, too. you got it? Yeah. Now, so you're, it's now you're video. Yep. Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I was on the phone earlier, but um, just a question about Empress versus Emacs. So if Empress is harder to work with for ceramics, do they end up charging more for their anterior restorations? No. no. No, okay. it's it's the same thing. I have not seen a lab charge more for Empress and Emacs. What I have seen labs do is charge more for prepless veneers than any time you prep because they break those because they're 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters. They break those like crazy. Not all labs charge more, but some labs will charge you more for a prepless case. So just be aware of that. You know, it's exact opposite that we think, well, but they're using hardly any material. It should be less, right? Um, it's actually more because they break a lot of those, at least one or two units in every single case. Wow. Okay. And okay. then my second question was just something uh, unrelated, but I did email this to you recently. Um, oh. Is yeah. anyone going to the Dental Influencers Alliance? I think you were there lo last year, Dr. Hornbrook, yeah, right? I was there last year. I'm not going this year. Okay. Um, is anyone from the Phoenix this year? Uh, Scott, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good meeting. It's a very interesting meeting because everyone's like best friends, but they've never met each other. And, <laughs> and, it, and it was so funny. Was like, you know, these I call them kids, your kids, right? You know, in their 20s, that you know, they know everyone, but they don't know everyone. And I have a 24 year old son, and I remember when he used to play World of the Warcraft and he had friends all over the world. And I'd say, dude, get out there and play with your friends. He says, I'm playing with all my best friends. I have like 2,000 of them, but he had never seen them. He didn't know them, but they were his friends. And so it was a weird conference for me because they had never met these people. And, and even like I lectured last year and the people in San said, oh, you know, like, I, I love you that, you know, all your posts, like we had met each other multiple times, but they had just read my post a bunch of times. But it's, it's very fun and it's cool and it's, it's, it's good. Are you going? I am, yeah. So I'd be happy to meet up with anyone from this group if they're also going. Yeah, I'm going. I'll see you probably there. Okay. Oh, cool. And you were there last year, kids. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a big group. It's a big group. But a fun, it's a fun group. Um, the other thing I kind of want you to keep in the back of your head is my favorite aesthetic group is the ASDA, American Society of Dental Aesthetics, um, which is a great group. And... There, it's it's kind of getting older in in demographics, and so one of my goal the last five years was to introduce a new younger demographic, and so through a, what they call the Irwin Smigel um, scholarship, I sponsor up to ten young dentists 
that get to go to the meeting for free. Now you have to get there and you have to stay somewhere, but you don't have to pay the 15 or 1600 bucks for the meeting. And it's a great meeting. I mean, the, the people are so great. They're so welcoming. And we had seven this year in Phoenix. Next year it's in um, Palm Springs and it's in October. And you have to do, you have to be a member of the Crown Council. You have to be a young dentist. Um, so that's a gift from me and, and ASDA as part of this young dentist. So later in the year, you will get an email from me. It's always in October. You could look it up if you want to kind of save the date. Um, but it's the first 10 that, that reply to me, get to go. And so I just want you to kind of keep that in the back of your head. Kit, have you been to that meeting with Joshi, the ASDA? He was no, there. Okay. I have been, yes. It's a great meeting. Great okay. meeting. And I, and I would like for you guys to be part of that. So it's in October. It's the ASDA. It stands for American Society of Dental Aesthetics. So I want you to keep that in the back of your head as well. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Um, it, again, if you don't know the schedule, we wake up very early and it'll be in Nashville. We start early because that's the only time that we can. So we start at like 6.30, I think, right, Stuart? On Saturday, yeah. I mean, Friday we'll do lunch. That's when we meet for the first time is Friday during lunch. But then Saturday morning we have to meet early for the mastermind and then we'll meet again Saturday at lunch. So yeah. the whole rest of the annual event is kind of going on. And while everyone else is going to lunch, at a lunch and learn or doing their own thing, you guys just don't get a break. It's just, <laughs> we just keep going. Uh, you get lunch. We provide you lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's like six hours extra inside of the meeting is yeah. kind of how I look at it. So, Are you, you all going to the meeting in Nashville? Yes. Have, have you all been to the meeting before? No. Oh, awesome. It's great. It's a non... The only dental thing about this whole meeting is the six hours you're going to spend with me. Yeah. Right? It is not a dental meeting at all. It's about really team building and self-worth. And, and I mean, the, the speakers are, are New York Times bestselling authors. You'd recognize most of them. They're really about their life-changing moments. Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't even seen, I don't even know who's speaking this year, but it, it is a very, very cool meeting that you're going to get a whole lot of benefit for yourself, everyone in your life, because again, it's not, not dental. It's about you and relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah, it'll, be a lot, it'll be a lot of fun too. Thursday, uh, we'll have a huge concert, a Smiles for Life benefit concert at the Ryman Auditorium with Dr. Dennis Wells is inviting his, his patients. And uh, they're usually, you know, Brooks and Dunn and Dirk Bentley and anyone famous has been to this thing. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Thursday yeah. night's going to be a lot of fun. So, when's the pajama party? So I, I've never taken my team. My <laughs> team party. Yeah. <laughs> and so now they're now they're online looking for pajamas. Yeah, pajama yeah. Party. <laughs> Get your onesie. Get your custom onesie ready. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fun. Yeah. If you have, if you haven't made a decision whether you're going to go or not, you absolutely want to go. Yeah. Most everyone in the group is. Um, I mean, as it, it's part of the fee that you pay to be part of the Young Dentist program is to attend the annual event. So hopefully, mm -hmm. everybody, hopefully everybody's coming. So good. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate you. Oh, and uh, it's always my pleasure. I'll uh, I'll send a follow up email to everybody. I'd love to hear what you want to hear uh, next, and and kind of what direction if you guys want to give me direction, uh, who we want to hear from. Um, my close friend Brian Harris, who's going to be at the uh, that dental influencer meeting. Um, I talked to him about joining us next time and possibly talking about Instagram and his smile virtual consult. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a kind of a neat product to couple with what David has, or I've talked to Chris Hammond. He, he wanted to participate with us. Uh, one of David's good friends and, and David's mentored Chris for years. He was our first young dentist program participant. Um, but we also have lots of neat businesses. So a marketing executive and a, um, We've got a really neat lady who manages a lot of people's questions when there's uh, hiring or firing um, or associate pay or anything that has to do with a, a team, the intricacy of owning a team and a business. So I'll follow up with an email and you guys let me know uh, where you want to go. I'd, I'd love to kind of cater, 
cater to you. So sure. Thank you. All right, David, I'm gonna I'm gonna end us. We've gone a little bit over, so I appreciate you guys and um here's my dog. Oh guapo! <laughs> I met him before, he's so cute. <laughs> yeah, he's a character. He usually comes to the meeting. So